Amen. Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. But I'll talk to us for a while on the topic, you need iron. You need iron. Colossians 2, verses 10 through 15. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Hallelujah. Thank God today for the word of the Lord. Let's bow our heads once again and pray. King Jesus, Master of the universe, Creator of all things, God of this world and the world to come, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the bread of life, we thank you, God, today for the presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of God. I only pray, God, that those who are watching by reason of the Internet would also today feel and sense and enjoy the powerful anointing and presence of the power and presence of God that we feel in this place. Lord, the Word of God must go forth. And today I stand before you as nothing more and nothing less than a human being that is full of faults and sin, weakness, Master, today I ask God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest heavily upon me, for you've given me, I believe today, a powerful, important word for the church. We need to hear this, O oh God, but more than hearing words, we need to have a heart and a mind that is determined to receive from it. Cultivate right now by the Holy Ghost every heart of every hearer, those listening now, those who will listen later by reason of the internet. Turn up, O oh God, any foul ground, any hard earth. Remove any rocks or stones that might cause the Word of God to be unable to take root. Pull up! God today, every thistle and every thorn, every weed that would try to choke out the truth of God which is about to be imparted. And today, oh God, keep at bay every scavenger bird that would come and steal away the seed that is cast upon the ground. 
let the seed fall upon good ground. Let the ground be prepared to receive it. Let there be no obstacle, O oh God, which would cause the Word of God to not have the time and the ability to take root and to grow up within our hearts that it might yield fruit unto righteousness. Master, in the name of Jesus, we need you today like we've never needed you. We need to hear the anointed Word of God, not sermonettes for Christianettes. We ask it all and none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. You need iron. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Coloss of the circumcision not made with hands. He said there is a spiritual circumcision in the New Testament church which takes the place of that physical circumcision of the Old Testament of the law that was given by, Mos uh, by God to Moses. And the New Testament circumcision, the New Testament mark that you are a born-again child of God, is baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Paul said, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And immediately thereafter, he says, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Most of us understand that in this life and in the flesh, there are things that are essential to our survival. There are things that are essential to our health. For instance, many people will take multivitamins and supplements in order to provide uh, various things that they may not quite be getting from their diet. They may not eat enough iron. They may not eat enough uh, liver. They may not eat enough beef. They may not eat enough meat that would provide iron for their blood. And without iron, our bodies become anemic, and anemia causes us to become weak and causes us to become tired and unable to function. So there are things that we need in our diet. Whether we like it or not, we must have these things, and without these things, we will become sickly. We will become ill. We will fall victim to infirmity. So if we cannot get those things through the process of our normal diet, we will take supplements to ensure that we get enough zinc, we get enough vitamin C, we get enough iron for our blood. I'm here to tell you today that in the kingdom of our God, there are too many Christians running around who are anemic. There is something that is essential to their walk with God that they simply will not submit themselves to. They will not allow themselves to ingest and digest enough iron. But you need iron. The Word of God tells us that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is something that we identify with in the course of baptism. We know that baptism represents 
being alive, being buried, and being brought again to new life, even as Jesus lived, died, and was raised again from the dead. But we also must understand that the Word of God tells us plainly that the old man, the person of the flesh, that carnal part of us which can only understand, which can only digest carnal things, worldly things, earthly things, that old man must die. You cannot have resurrection unless that which is old dies. You can't get the new until you bury the old. Too many people go into the waters of baptism and they lay down the old man and they come up the old man. The only difference between the two being the one that comes up is wet, the one that went down was dry. Am I telling the truth? Amen. We know today from the Word of God in John chapter 19, Verses 31 through 37, the story of the Lord's crucifixion. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him, meaning with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he, he that saw it bare record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. In order for a sacrifice to be acceptable to God, according to the Old Testament law given by the Lord to Moses on Mount Sinai, a sacrifice had to be a lamb that was inspected and a lamb that was as perfect as could possibly be seen at least with the naked eye. If a lamb had a broken leg, if a lamb had a broken rib or a cracked skull from an accident on a mountainside somewhere, that lamb did not qualify for sacrifice. So the moment that a lamb was involved in an accident, the moment that a lamb wounded itself, it was no longer able to be offered to God in sacrifice. Makes you think of the Lord being brought by Satan to the top of the pinnacle of the temple and how Satan tempted him and said, why don't you cast yourself down? Why don't you throw yourself down? After all, the Word of God says that your, your angels will come and protect you so that you don't hit the ground knowing all the while that the Word of God tells us also, as Jesus reminded him, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But Satan knew what he was doing. Why don't you just go ahead and jump? Let's see how many bones we can break, because the moment they're broken, you no longer will be a sufficient sacrifice. Oh, hallelujah. You no longer will do mankind any good 
on the cross of Calvary. Why don't you just go ahead and jump and let's see what happens. Oh, them had to be perfect. The law of Moses was so explicit concerning the sacrificial process. A lamb could not be killed by asphyxiation. He could not be suffocated. A lamb could not be hung by the neck. For the lamb to be offered to God in sacrifice, his artery had to be cut and he had to be allowed to bleed out. His life had to leave his body in response to the loss of blood. Many people theologically and historically have wondered why it is that Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross of Calvary rather than tied. You see, the Roman culture and the Romans of old ancient times, like so many cultures in ancient times, used the cross as an instrument of torture and torment. The idea behind the cross was that anyone who saw someone die on a cross would be detoured from committing similar acts that caused them then to wind up on a cross. We know historically that oftentimes men were tied with rope to a cross. They were hung out in the heat of the sun. A cross was never erected in a shady area under the shade of a tree. No, the crosses were placed oftentimes where traffic would pass by so that there'd be those who'd be traveling and as they would come by there'd be that warning there'd be that billboard warning them you'd better act right you'd better honor our laws you'd better do as we tell you to do am i telling the truth now it was a deterrent it was an instrument of torture not merely an instrument of death so it was not the Roman practice, listen to me now, to make death swift. Crucifixion was not designed to be a quick death. Oftentimes men who were tied to a cross and hung out in the sun would literally hang there for days before their body would finally give out and they would slump down and they would be unable to support themselves any longer and in the slumping they would cut off their air supply and they would suffocate upon the cross. Why was Jesus crucified with Nails. Why did they use spikes through his hands and through his feet? Why was this done? It's possible, if not probable, that the Jews who insisted he be crucified behind the scenes also insisted that he be nailed rather than be tied partly because they knew this will deter anybody else from coming against our traditions. This will deter anybody else from speaking against our doctrines and speaking against those things which we teach. Hello now. You see, they as Jews could not engage in this practice, but they could use the Romans to engage in it. 
funny how many Christians there are in our world who know they cannot lie or they cannot cheat or they cannot steal or they cannot murder or they cannot do a lot of things, but they sure will allow others around them to do it, if not encourage them to do it. Mm -hmm. That way they can say, oh, but Lord, I didn't do it. But did you have some part? You know, there is such a thing in the criminal courts as an accomplice to the crime. Am I telling the truth? And there are many Christians today like the, the Jews of old who didn't commit the crime, but they served as accomplices. The Passover was coming. This was a high holy day. And the Jews knew the cross is not designed to be a swift death. The Romans don't care about our Passover. That's not one of their holidays. They don't care anything about it. So if Jesus is to die swiftly so we can get him off that cross and bury him before Passover, then he'll have to be nailed, which probably was reserved for more serious crimes and more severe crimes. But he'll have to be nailed rather than tied. We don't know that the other two men were nailed. The Word of God doesn't say a word at all about them. They may very well have been tied, whereas Jesus was nailed. We don't know. We do know that Jesus died before they did. And the Jews wanting the bodies to come off the crosses before Passover then went to the leadership of the Roman government and said, let's expedite this because our holiday is coming. And the way in which death would be expedited if they wanted to expedite it, they would go and they would break the men's legs. And by breaking the men's legs, they were no longer able to push themselves up, even if they're feet were tied and they were standing on a small platform uh, on the base of the cross they would no longer be able to push themselves up and their body would slump and their rib cage would begin to put compression upon their lungs and what it would do is it would cause asphyxiation it would cause them to no longer be able to breathe freely and between the hunger and the thirst during the time they hung on the cross between the exposure to the sun and then adding to that the inability to pull in a full breath, their death would be expedited. Yet when they came to Jesus, they realized he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. And John the Apostle whom Jesus loved records in his account, he said, just like the Word of God says, a bone of him shall not be broken. Hallelujah. He is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundations of the world. He is that perfect and holy sacrifice. And not one bone of his body will be broken. Nothing will occur to him that will cause his sacrifice to be anything less than acceptable to God. Hallelujah. We understand the crucifixion story. The Word of God tells us in Hebrews 9.22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Sin cannot be washed away. Sin cannot be forgiven without blood. We're told by the Word of God that it was essential that blood be spilled. This is why lambs were sacrificed. This is why Jesus had to go to the cross. I believe this is why Jesus was crucified with nails rather than hung with rope as was common for so many and by the way in the gospels and not one account of the gospels do we read of the soldiers nailing him to the cross we're simply told he was crucified how do we know then that he was 
crucified with nails rather than crucified with rope, as was the custom for so many. The Word of God tells us in John chapter 20, verses 24 and 25, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This is speaking of after the resurrection. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. We also read in our primary text today I gotta put my glasses on so I can see. Verse 14, Colossians chapter 2. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, meaning that worked against us, and took it out of the way. It was an obstacle that God removed. How? Nailing it to the cross. So there are a number of references elsewhere that explain he was nailed to the cross rather than tied. But in the actual gospel accounts, we don't read specifically of his being nailed, but we read elsewhere of the nails. We do read in the gospels of his side being pierced after they found him dead on the cross and blood and water pouring forth from the wound from his side, indicating in fact he had had a massive rupture of the heart. Blood and water. You talk to any scientist or any doctor and they'll tell you there are forensic physicians and uh, scientists who have looked at the historical account of the death of Jesus and they've said this indicates that his heart in effect uh, almost exploded. And that is why you see a combination of blood and water. Normally you would simply see blood. But in the case of Christ, we saw both blood and water. So we read of the spirit aside in the gospel accounts, but we only read of the nails elsewhere in the telling and in referring to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, the Apostle Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul declares, I am crucified with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 31, the Word of God declares, I protest by your rejoicing, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. You see, we cannot experience the circumcision of our spirit, which is baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. We cannot experience a new birth we cannot experience a new existence, a new life following death, unless, of course, we have died. Too many Christians want the new life, but they don't want to have died. Too many Christians want new life in Christ, but they do not want to be crucified with Christ. Are you hearing me today? 
No crucifixion hurts. Crucifixion is painful. Crucifixion is difficult. Yeah, but you need iron. The cross was made of wood. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. The cross was made of wood. The crown of thorns was made of a plant. All those things will quickly fade away. They're not substances that last very long. They're not substances that are very hard. They're not substances that can do a great deal of damage. Oh, hallelujah. The lamb had to bleed out. And in order for the lamb to bleed out, he had to have iron. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! There had to be nails. There had to be a spear. There had to be a head on that spear that was able to pierce his flesh. The wood alone couldn't do it. Oh my God. The wood alone would only be able to bring him to a place of suffocation. The wood alone would be able to bring him to a place of heat stroke. The wood alone would be able to cause him to suffer a lengthy amount of time until he finally could no longer support his breathing on that cross, his legs having been broken. There was iron needed. If you're going to be crucified with Christ, don't think for one minute you're going to be crucified differently than he was. I'm willing to be crucified with Christ. I'm getting a little warm today. I'm willing to be crucified with Christ just so long as I'm tied to my cross and I am not nailed to it. Well, honey, if you're not nailed to it, then you're not crucified with Christ because he was nailed to it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm willing to serve God. I'm willing to be a Christian. I'm willing to live for the Lord as long as my life only has mild interruptions mild inconveniences, mild discomforts, mild pains. How many people are Christians and when the difficult times come, when things get hard, they begin to cry, why God, this isn't fair God, I'm your child God, I'm not supposed to go through these things Lord. And Jesus answers back, Oh, yes, you are. You need iron. Oh, I hope you're hearing me today. You need iron. If your sacrifice is to be acceptable to God, you need iron. If you are to be crucified with Christ, you need iron. That means you got to bleed out. You cannot die by any other means. You must bleed out. It must be a complete death so that it is not necessary for your legs to be broken. Do you hear what I'm telling you now, children? In order for that to be accomplished, you must experience the nails. You must experience the sword, excuse me, the spear in your side. Now mind you, he was already dead, so the spear in his side didn't hurt at all. But you need the nails. You need iron. Oh my God. The Apostle Paul said, I've come to realize that the suffering that I experience in this present life nowhere near begins to compare with the glory that I'll experience one day. Hallelujah. The Word of God declares that Jesus, who 
for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame. Yet we've got Christians in our world today who want to live ironless lives. I don't want pain. I don't want sorrow. I don't want hardship. I don't want things that cause me to hurt. I don't want things that bring my old man to his death. And by the way, children, the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. That means that you can't just kill the old man in one sitting. I don't know about you, but my old man, he sits up in the coffin how many times a day? Hello now. I don't know how many times a day that old devilish man of mine sits up and says, Okay, I'm ready to take control again. I'm ready. You ready to get in the flesh and do things the way that the enemy would have you to do them rather than the way God would have you to do them. You're ready to get back into a carnal mindset. You're ready to get back into a carnal frame of thinking. I need iron. I pull out them old spikes and here we go again, trapes into the cross because I've got to nail that old man down one more time. Am I telling the truth now? You wonder why we Pentecostals have altar services. You wonder why we come to the altars and we weep and we pray after every church service. We talk to the Lord about that which we've heard. That which we've received from the Word of God. I'll tell you why we do that. Because we're nailing the old man down one more time. Every time you go to that altar, every time you go to prayer, every time you go before God in response to the preached Word of God, you're literally applying a nail to that area in your life that you just heard the preacher talking about. Lord, my pride. Preacher, preach don't pride today. I've got to crucify that old pride. And you go to the altar and you start nailing that pride to the cross. Lord, my lust. I've got to get my lust under control. God, my jealousy. I've got to get my jealousy, my envy, my hatred, my malice got to nail these things to the cross. Make sure they die. You've given me new life on account. On account of what? On account of your grace. You let me come up out of that water claiming to be a new man. Even though you knew that the process of becoming that new man was going to last my entire lifetime. You let me come out of that water and you immediately called me son. You immediately called me daughter. You immediately called me my child, even though I was still nowhere near what I'll one day be. Oh, thank God for His mercy. Amen. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for His love. Thank God the Word of God said He calls those things which be not as though they were. That doesn't mean you get off easy. That doesn't mean now that you're not going to have to nail those things to the cross. That did not mean the old man isn't going to have to fully die. No, throughout the course of our entire lifetime, every circumstance that comes into our life, every situation that comes into our life, the Word of God said all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to His purpose. But do you know what the good in that situation or that circumstance may be? The good in that circumstance may be that God is helping you to nail something to that cross that you otherwise won't be able to nail. Oh my goodness. God may allow something to come into your life that will help you to nail your pride to that cross. God may cause something to come into your life that will cause you to nail vanity to the cross. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? God may cause an experience to come into your life that will cause you to nail something, a lack of faith, 
Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So if we're lacking faith, sometimes God will cause something to come into our life that will force us to understand and embrace faith, finally. Like we ought to it from the get-go, but we weren't quite able to. I think of the old song by Christian author, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The author of that marvelous old hymn of the church wrote that song as he rode a steamship home from a mission field where he had been working as a missionary. His wife and daughter fell ill with sickness while on the mission field and they both died and he had to bury them on foreign soil. Coming home on the ship, going back to his homeland to take a little time off and to rest and recuperate and to deal with the loss of his wife and daughter. Of course, obviously, his heart was broken. He was heavy. He was grieving. And yet, suddenly, the words to this song were inspired in his spirit because he realized God, God was causing something in his life to be nailed to that cross. There was something in him that needed to be nailed. There was some part of his old man. And for that reason, I am able to say, Lord, you know what? In every circumstance, in every situation, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how terrible it is, it is well. It is well with my soul. Hallelujah. I trust you, Lord. I know I need iron. I know I can't go through life with feathers and down. I know I can't go through life with everything soft and cushy and comfortable. I know as a child of God, what does the Word of God say? I say this all the time. Paul said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, what a living sacrifice. The doctor comes in and says, Pastor, you have leukemia. Ouch. Oh my God. But I need iron. Doctor comes in and says, Pastor, you have Diabetes, ouch, but I need iron. I can't go through life and not feel the nails. Oh my God, are you hearing me today, children? I can't go through life and not experience piercings. I cannot go through life and not experience wounds that will cause my soul to bleed out. I can't go through life and not be in the process, listen to me now, children, of dying. Isn't it funny? Listen to me. Isn't it funny that when a baby is born, we begin to count the years of its life. One year old, we have a party. Two years old, we have a party. Oh, I'm telling you, we celebrate every year of that child's life. Yet every year, that child is drawing closer and closer and closer to the day of death. Am I telling the truth? So what really begins when we start life? We begin to die. What really begins when we come out of the waters of baptism, race to newness of life? We start to die. 
oh my God, are you hearing me today? We begin the death process. Those of us who have lived for the Lord any length of time, any of us who have been in the church and given our life to Christ for any length of time, we know that we're nearer home than I was yesterday. Closer to God along the way. Each step I take, each prayer I pray, I'm nearer home than I was yesterday. Every single day that I live for God, I know that I'm getting closer to dying in God. Hallelujah. It's not that I'm obsessed with death. It's not that I think of death every minute of every day. But the sad reality is that's the ultimate end. And yet we have Christians that live their lives today and they live their spiritual lives as though death is not at all part of the equation. Lastly, this afternoon in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25, excuse me, 35 through 38, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, but some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. When we're buried with Christ in baptism, what we were dies. Just like a seed in the ground dies. That seed doesn't grow. You don't wind up coming out a month later and seeing a seed this big laying on the ground, do you? No. What, what, what you planted is not what you see come up. When a person is circumcised in Christ, when they're buried with Christ in baptism, what you see come out of the waters of baptism is only the initial shoot. It's only the initial tiny sapling. You're just seeing that seed die so that the plant can be released and the new body can appear. But that seed, after it has died and the new plant appears, is that plant that you see when you look and you see a little tiny plant that big, is that all that's ever going to be there? No. Hopefully that plant's going to grow and grow and grow, and eventually it's going to come to the place where it bears fruit. I know people who have been in the church, been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. They've been in the church for 30 years, and you know what? When you look at them, they're still babes. They're still children. They're still saplings. They're still little shoots. They are so immature in the faith. They are so lacking understanding and enlightenment and revelation in the faith because they're not willing to let the old man die. They're not willing to keep visiting the cross. They're not willing to understand that in this process you need iron. You can't hang on the cross with rope. The crown of thorns will not cause enough blood loss so that you will die in a manner you, you're supposed to. No, you need iron. You need those nails. You need the head of that spear so that you can be offered to God and sacrifice in the manner that God demands. Children, I want to tell you today, we're going through some hard times right now. We're experiencing some difficulties in our world right now. People are crying and some have genuine concerns. Some are going through genuine troubles. 
Others are just whiners. They're not going hungry. They're not suffering. They're not, you know, they're not in terror of where their next meal will come from, but they're just whiners. But there are many who are genuinely hurting and going through things. Let me remind you today, you need iron. You need iron. In order to experience resurrection, in order to experience miracles in God, you must endure the cross as Christ endured the cross. You can despise the shame of it, but you must be willing to endure it. Am I telling the truth today? So this afternoon, I remind you, and I remind me, I remind all who would listen, all who will hear me, you need iron. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the Lord.